Okay, guys, thanks. thanks for returning. I see it didn't scare everybody off last week. Um, this is going to be part two of uh, a teaching on intercession, intercessory prayer. And um, remember, uh, the basic premise of, of this teaching is, is that um, Jesus, by definition in the scriptures, only said he, the things he heard the Father say, and he only did the things he saw the Father do. So there's that kind of intimate communion with him. And all the words we've learned over the, these many years, and they're great words, but there's, there's, a, there's a reality and there's power behind, behind those words and in the words. Like, you know, we're temples of the Holy Spirit. Um, yes. Um, our thoughts can come from the world, the flesh, or the devil, or it can come from the Holy Spirit. And, and you know, and this, the thoughts that come from God are always going to be in line with the scriptures, and they're always going to be in line with the teaching order of the church. And that still small voice within us, as we begin to recognize that, um, we can begin to trust it, and we need to. And, and when we obey it, um, very good things happen. Um, I told you a couple examples last week of things that were, were happening like that. Um, I'll give you a, a one more one more example. In intercession, we can go and we can say to, say to the Lord, "I'm going to trust you. I got a lot of stuff that's going on, okay? But I know you can take care of that." I'm going to come here today and I'm going to say, here I am, Lord, I come to do your will. Tell me what you want me to pray about. And I'm going to trust you're going to take care of the rest of this stuff. And that takes courage. Um, and sometimes, he, just because we have a life of prayer, he speaks to us. Um, a very, you know, marked example of that in my life was in May of 2001, I had been working corporately and I had a side business and I was doing ministry. We had four children at that point, uh, uh, none of them had been married. And uh, I woke up one morning and the Lord said to me, the way I hear him, um, I want you to stop your side business, I just want you to do your corporate job and I want you to spend more time in prayer and study. And I said, well, it's probably not the enemy of my soul is telling me to spend more time in prayer and study, so I decided I'm just I'm going to do that. So I pulled the plug on this business, which was, a, it wasn't making a lot of money, but it was a profitable business. And I made my adjustments and uh, I just, I did that. And my son John had graduated from college and he went to work and did an internship, at, internship after, actually after getting his degree. And he worked in New York. <clears throat> it was in a music industry uh, advertising firm in Manhattan, but he was living in, in Queens. And he called me up and said, hey dad, I've, uh, I've loved living in New York, um, but my intern hours are up this coming week, and I think I'd like to come home. Can you come and get me? And I said, well, yes, I can, because when I had pulled the plug on the business, I had already paid for a conference. I had already put money on it. I hardly ever do put money on stuff I don't do. <laughs> I just don't do that. I had already paid for a conference that weekend out in Detroit, and I said, well, I'm not going to Detroit this weekend. Yes, I can come and get you. Gave my daughter Gabriel was home, and we drove down, it was a beautiful, beautiful day in, 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 uh, in New York, and we picked them up in Queens, we went to Manhattan, had lunch, and saw a couple sites, and we drove home. If I would, had not been able to pick them up that Saturday, which was September 8th, 2001, I would have picked them up September 15th, 2001, and he took a, a train from Queens to the World Trade Center every morning at 9 o'clock. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you, you know, when God tells us to do something you don't know, I had absolutely no earthly or heavenly idea why he was telling me to do that. I sure am glad that I listened to him in that case. I don't always listen and obey, okay? I'm trying to ask him for the grace of obedience. You know, Jesus was, a, was obedient unto death, and when he, learned, he learned obedience through what he suffered. You gotta understand, you know, we all have suffering in our lives, and you know, as I, as I might have said last week, but I heard it said one time, suffering itself isn't bad, but wasted suffering is terrible. 
you know. And so we can use those things that are happening in our lives that are hard, and I don't know, I, I'm pretty sure everybody can say they got some hard stuff going on, but that, that's, where we, that's where we meet. I was gonna say, yeah, Joe. I just I was watching uh, um, something on the fundamentals of Catholicism, and it said that we can use our suffering, like Jesus suffered to redeem the human race. We can use our suffering to help in that too. We can do, use our suffering or offer it up for the salvation of souls. Absolutely, and that's that's why that's why intercession and union with Christ are so incredibly important. Um, I had uh, this is from uh, Saint John Paul II um, encyclical that he wrote. Uh, it says it is obvious that the Church professes the mercy of God revealed in the crucified and risen Christ not only by the word of her teaching, but above all through the deepest pulsation of the life of the whole people of God. By means of this testimony of life, the church fulfills the mission proper to the people of God, the mission which is a sharing in, and in a sense, a continuation of the messianic mission of Christ himself. So we, we do, but the way we do that is because it's like, Jesus died once and for all on the cross. I mean, when he was done, it was done. He said it's finished. But the, the reality of that is made, is made real to us in, 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 in the Eucharist, okay? Uh, it's not like he's being crucified again, but the, the life, death, and resurrection is all folded up into that, and the power is made available to us. And it's like we said last week, you know, of the 30% of the Catholics that do come to church, only 31% of those people believe in the real presence. So we're, we're, in, a, we're in a ditch. Um, but that's okay, because God's not asleep at the switch, and he's got a plan, and each one of us has a part in it. Um, in, the, in learning to pray, you know, only God, I've heard it said, and I believe it's true, only, God's the only one that can teach us to pray. We can learn different forms, but to pray from the heart, to pray in the spirit, is where, where you know, that's, that's the prayer of the righteous man and woman. And, and, and th that prayer is effective. And so, uh, Mother Nadine uh, Brown, as I mentioned last week, um, she told a story about asking, well, we asked Jesus, what's your prayer? And then pray that prayer. Because the prayer at the right hand of the Father is always heard. My Father always hears me, okay? So, she was, said these four ladies had gone to this conference where they taught this principle of asking the Lord about what's your prayer? And uh, they had been praying, the four of them, for the closing of this particular abortion clinic for a long, 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 long time, and nothing was happening, but it was doing more business. And they said, well, we, we, we believe that, you know, abortion is not of God's will, and, uh, but we also think, you know, no, we can ask him what he wants. And so they said, Lord, how do you want us to pray about this? And this, the way the story goes, those four of them were driving in a car, and all four of them instantaneously got the same message from God, confirming with one another. And he said, uh, pray that the owner of the abortion clinic could have a change of heart, conversion of heart. And that's why they started praying, and within a month time, he had a conversion of heart and closed down the clinic. So I, I look at that and try and apply it to my own life about those different walls that I hit into, you know? And I'll go and I'll cycle around them and I'll go back and I'll hit into them again, you know? And I'm trying to throw the kitchen sink in prayer at those things, and God would say, if you just listen to me, I'll tell you to take out this brick over here and the whole wall will go down. You know, like I say, you know, in, in the army now, they have smart bombs where they can go in. Hopefully they have the right targets, but, uh, you know, why, why shouldn't we have smart prayers? Why, why shouldn't we have informed prayers, informed by the Holy Spirit? You know, it's great to pray. And I mean, when I, did, when I didn't understand hearing God's voice as well as I do now, and I'm not saying I'm perfect on it by any means. But I, I just would cover it with a volume of prayer. <laughs> I would pray all sorts of different things. And I'm sure the Lord was, you know, he liked my persistence in that, but I don't know if it was terribly effective, honestly. I, I just don't know if it was that effective. But, um, so we need to learn. Yes, Jane. Just, I'm sorry, Frank, I, this kind of came into my mind, the scripture of when we were talking about, you know, idea that we could 
suffer and you right. are suffering as a crime and it helps save souls. And the scripture that came to me was making up for the suffering or suffering of lacking in Christ. You know, so isn't there a scripture like that? Participating in grace. So sufferings are lacking in the body, it says. In the body, actually. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, and, and so there is. And you know, in our sufferings can all right, I, 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 let me address this by, by telling you a, a, a story from New Orleans. I told you last week about some of the things that happened in that conference in 1986. <clears throat> One of the speakers was Pastor, pastor Paul Young Cho. He was the pastor of the largest Pentecostal church in the world that was in Seoul, Korea. And they had thousands of people that were, like we have so many hundreds of families in St. Anthony's, but they don't all come to church and they don't all pray. Okay? Everybody in his church prayed. They went to prayer. And uh, this American army chaplain had been uh, transferred from Germany to Seoul, Korea with the, uh, with the soldiers that he was ministering to. And he, and he saw Pastor Cho and he said, Pastor Cho, something is happening, I don't understand it. He said, what is it? He says, well, in Germany, same chaplain, same sermons, same soldiers, nada. I thought, what's going on? Over here, they're giving their hearts to the Lord. And Pastor Cho says, well, I, I can tell you exactly what's happening. Our church has taken control over the spirits and the powers in the air over this region, and we broke their power so that the word can go forth, <laughs> forth without interference, basically. I'm putting words in his mouth. But you see, who wouldn't hear the gospel, the good news of God forgiving our sins, opening the gates to heaven to us, giving us the power to live the life that he wants us to live, without saying hallelujah and do a happy dance about it? But why don't people do that? Because they're like the, the radio station's staticky, and they're diverted to all these different type of things. And, and one of the effects of intercession is to clear the airwaves, so to speak. And I was going to fold a, a separate teaching into this on spiritual warfare, but the Lord told me not to do that, just to do intercession, and I'll do a separate thing on spiritual warfare at a different time. But, you know, our battle isn't against flesh and blood, let's face it. You know, it's a real, you know, we have real enemies of our soul. Nothing to fear. Jesus whipped their butt, took all their weapons about, away from them, and prayed them before the, the universe in ignominy. So, you know, they have no power except for deception. But they're very, very clever, and they're very smart. Much smarter than our human intelligence. Not as smart as Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Ghost. Not as smart as Michael the Archangel. Today's the Feast of the Archangels. Yay! Yeah. Goes, like, aren't we glad for Michael, Raphael, and Gabriel? You know, they're the ones that are named. But we we can um, we can go to prayer and learn how to pray deeply, so that. And I'm doing this more regularly too. And I won't tell you the details about it; they're too personal. But I know when I know what the fruit of the spirit is. I know what the gifts of the spirit are. I know the definition of love, and when I see things in my life, you know, basically it's all come down to me seeing those things in my life. And if I can even see them in your life, it's an only indication that the only reason I can understand it is because it's in my life. So it's not about you, it's about me. <laughs> my wife, my children, the, you know, it's all, it's all about me. It's, it's been, taken me a really, really, really long time to begin to really grapple with that and understand that, that that's the reality of it. Um, but when those spirits come, we have authority over them. We can bind them. And without getting into a lot of the aspects of it, some things you have to, if the person's not in good shape and doesn't have good uh, community to support them, sometimes you just can't cast things out. You just have to bind them and, you know, and just keep on binding them. Sometimes you can bind them and just cast them out. And Mother Nadine says the best way to cast them out is to say, I command you in the name of Jesus to be gone and go directly and immediately to the foot of the cross and never return. Because you don't want them to stop and make any other trips and <laughs> stops along the way. And don't ever return to the face of the earth. And Heavenly Father, you revealed through Jesus that you want to leave anything empty, nice, swept, and clean, so they can go back with seven times, seven more spirits worse than they are. Fill them with the Holy Spirit. So there's always that's the motion. We get out the junk and we ask the Holy Spirit to come in and fill us. Okay? Now, I, I've, been, I've been consciously getting junk out since Friday at 10 o'clock before Mother's Day in 1973. Okay? And I'm just finding out how much more junk there has to go. 
But that's okay because he's got me past the point of being afraid of my weaknesses or embarrassed or ashamed about them. His father already knows about him and he already gave me a remedy through the blood of Christ. He already gave me the power to overcome them through the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay? So I just need to face them and bring them to him and say, can you help the boy? <laughs> the boy needs some help. The boy don't know how to do this. Okay? And he does. He's, he's just waiting for this crack. You know, it's like I heard the, the image one time, and they were talking about evil spirits, but it's absolutely true for God as well, is that if you ever had a cat and you open the door a little bit, the cat shoots right in? Well, if we do things in our lives that open the doors to evil, the evil shoots right in. But when we, when we do a little something to, toward God, when we draw near to him, he draws near to us. Far more powerfully and faster and more wonderful than anything the darkness can bring. All you got to do is, you know, it was dark. Joe, Giuseppe, and I came in here tonight. It was dark. I turned on one thing and the lights came on and all the darkness went. Yeah. He's the light of the world. And you know what he says? Gavin, you're the light of the world. Can you believe that? We're the light of the world. We're the salt of the earth. We're temples of the Holy Spirit. Peter says we partake in the divine nature. I mean, is that a reality to us or are those just really nice words? It's a rea it's, it, that's the truth. And see, we as a church need to start living the truth. Yes, sir. Uh, that's, I, I agree with you. And Jesus said something that you are the light of the world, you're the salt of the earth. Remember that in Matthew right after the, right after the uh, Beatitudes? Yep. It says you're, you're the salt of the earth, you're the light of the world. That's right. We don't light something up to put it under a bushel. Basket. That's right. And see, what's, what's, hap and what's happened, what the enemy tries to do is to bury us in stuff to cover up that light so that we're ineffective. Okay? I'll tell you what, when we know who we are in Christ, when our fit, feet hit the ground in the morning, Satan is scared <laughs> blankless because he knows we're awake and we're, we're about doing business. All the time. But only in the moment, if we are living in the past or in the future, That's right. we cannot take advantage of God's grace. It's only in each moment. You might say within a day, but even breaking it down just to this now moment. Right. You know, it's, um, if we can, and this is what I've been trying to focus on for years, honestly. And God is really freeing me of living in the past, forgetting the past, being angry at the past, whatever being shameful of mistakes, whatever, or worrying about the future. And I'm finding that as I pray for knowledge of God's will for me and the power to carry it out in each moment, I'm freer and freer and freer every day. And it's a real freedom, isn't it? It's an absolute it, freedom. Absolute I'm not totally there, Frank. So uh, don't get me wrong. We, I understand I that. Mistakes, but but we're fr you're freer than you have been. Absolutely. I'm freer than I have been. I know there's more freedom ahead of me. But that's what I said last week, you know, is God's led me through many trials and tribulations and the fruit of my own sinfulness. You know, you, we do reap what we sow. God forgives us, you know. But if you, if you poured poison into the lake and I'm sorry for it, I could be sorry for it, but there's still, still poison on the lake, okay? But let, let me give you something hopeful. Catherine and Sienna, my favorite. I'm going to paraphrase it. She said, if you receive God's love, he'll forgive you. But she says, if you receive God's love perfectly, he'll forgive you and he'll wipe out the effect of your sin. How would you like that? The effect of your sin wiped off the face of the earth. I mean, sooner or later it's going to happen. That's like, you know, we went back to uh, last week quoting uh, Father Maximilian, St. Bernard, what, what, what burns in hell is self-will. If, if you die with no self-will, there's nothing to burn. <laughs> right, something that, this might sound a little contradictory, so forgive me, and please clear things up if it's wrong, but I've heard, isn't, isn't there a scripture, or, you know, I've heard where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Correct. And, and Faustina, I believe from Faustina's work of divine mercy, Jesus says in there, a sinner, let's say you have a righteous person and you have a, 
a horrendous evil you know, sinner. You know, somebody who was creating these pesky babies, for instance. You know, such horrific, horrific, abominable evil. You know, trying to be God, the Creator. You know, if that person repents, my understanding is where sin abounds, grace abounds all that more. You know, Jesus died on the cross for everybody. Absolutely. He saw everything that was going to come down through the ages, and his his passion, death, and resurrection covered everybody's sin. If Judas would have so, repent, if Judas would have repented, God would have forgiven him. What I understand is that a person who has more sin, potentially they'd be more grateful, right? But they have they have a right to more grace. Well, that's why Paul, right Paul wrote God most of the New grace. Testament. He says, "I'm the greatest of all sinners." No, we, we, we do it well enough as it is. <laughs> as I said, you know, one day, when God willing, I'm there, I'm going to have a nice chat with Paul, and I'm saying, you wrote the book before you met me, bud. <laughs> so, intercession is, the Lord gave me this image a while back. He says, it's like the engine room in a ship. It's down, it's dark, it's dirty, it's small, but it turns the whole ship around. And nobody's going to come in and pat you on the back for being an intercessor. You're not going to probably get any recognition. Most of the stuff is only the Father's going to see it. But we're not doing anything other than for the Father to see it. So what the, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, I hadn't got all my praying and tongues time in today. And I had some time set aside. But my wife asked me to, to, to clip the back hedge. I said, okay, I can clip the back hedge and pray in tongues. Not a problem. So I got, you know, I killed two birds with one stone. You know? Did a little happy dance in the backyard cutting the hedge. Cutting the hedge was about the holiest thing I did today. You understand? Yes. The day in and day out stuff we do, we're not separated from them. In fact, Father made, uh, Ken made a beautiful thing at the, at the, at the Mass this morning at Feast of the Archangels. Um, it, it talks about, I, I think it was uh, Gabriel that said, you know, I'm always, I, the, the Archangels behold the face of the Heavenly Father while they're doing ministry to us. They never stop looking at the Heavenly Father. And you see, we, because we're linear and we, we're so bound by time and space, we don't understand that we can do a couple of things. We can multitask, so to speak. You know, Father Stephen always told me, he's my first, first, first spiritual director, he said, when you're speaking to somebody, speak and listen at the same time. Speak and listen. Speak and listen. You know? And that's why when you teach, I've got stuff I want to say, but then the Spirit says, well, let's go over and let's take it over over here. So you go over where we take it over. Let me, let me get past some stuff, because we got... We got we're limiting on time here. So, um, it's all bound up with a new commandment. We love one another as Jesus loved us. That, that is the difference between Christianity and every, everything else on the face of the earth. Um, and we gotta understand what that, that kind of love is. Um, this is how we'll know you're my disciples if you have love for one another. But the love that he has, the agape love, the uh, loving without looking for a return. Most of us are transactional. Most of our actions are transactional. And most of the church, and I, you know, you can take this or leave it, most of the church does not live in the New Covenant. Most of the church still is looking for retribution. Okay. Both grandparents on both sides are Sicilian. I understand the concept of retribution. Can I agree? Yeah. But the point is, is in the spirit, there is no retribution. In the spirit, this is what, what that kind of love is. Love your enemies, do the good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. If the person strikes you on one cheek, offer the other as well. If the person takes your cloak, not withhold even your tunic. Give to everyone that asks of you, and from the one who takes what is yours, do not demand it back. Most people have a hard time with that one. You know, Judas was one of the disciples, and he did portray Jesus. But you know, he, was the, he, was, he held the purse. All the monies that came in, they gave to him. And Jesus knew he was stealing from it. He didn't kick them out! Can you imagine you're a CEO, you know your CFO is stealing money, and you just say, go about what you gotta do. 
Jesus is way different than the world is. Way different. And we still are ruled by the world. A lot. By the flesh. You know, the simple example, and I don't think I used it last week, but I'll use it today. The way I understood it, there's, I think there's three major portions of God's interaction with man. There's before the law of Moses, the law of Moses, and there's the New, there's the New Testament. Before the law of Moses, if, if I went over to Gavin's village and I stole his chicken, they'd come over and they'd wipe out the village, right? Law of Moses, I steal his chicken, he comes over, he steals the chicken. New Testament, I steal a chicken, he forgives me and he gives me mashed potatoes and beans to go with it. <laughs> because we're attached to things. I understand being attached to things. You don't take the things with you. You don't. You can have all the gold you want and you're, you're, you're safe, but when you die, you ain't going to take a lick of it with you. Okay? And there's nothing wrong with having gold in your safe. Okay? But you can't take it with you. So, it's... He's, he said he's going to give us Ezekiel a new heart and place a new spirit within us. And, you know, I, I, I didn't give the whole testimony last week. I mean, it's on my YouTube channel of my, of my conversion testimony. But when I had my conversion, all these things led me to be in this room where this guy, this, this Jewish guy that had come to Christ, had us standing in a circle and praying at the end of this meeting he had in a college dorm room. And it was Friday of night, before Mother's Day in 1973. And he just said, as I come along, as the Lord leads, leads to lay hands on you, uh, don't say anything in English. Let the Lord fashion praise out of you. He was talking about speaking in tongues. And, you know, I, 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 you know I've come this far. I'm going to stand in the circle and I'm going to pray. I don't, you know. And so it was just as he was walking toward me, he was really near me. The Holy Spirit had been priming me for years and years and years. I didn't understand nothing of it. But... He made me say something he, from deep within the well of my being. And I said, Lord, unless you touch me, I'm going to perish. I didn't have no idea what that meant. But when the guy came and laid hands on me, it's like somebody threw on 100,000 volts and I lost complete awareness of everything around me. And I just had this image of a heart and I intuitively knew it was my heart. And water gushed out of that heart and the brick and the concrete that was all encrusting it started to break away. I thought it was a fate to come bleed back there on Friday before Mother's Day in 1973, but I found out it's the concrete and the brick is still breaking up. But that's okay. He's going he's gonna to complete the good work he began in me. I would like it to happen sooner than later, and he's, he's taken me to another step. And, and, we, and Scripture even says we can hasten the coming of the day of the Lord. That, to me, that means not only his final coming, but his coming to us more in fullness in our own lives. You know, uh, my senior Essef told me, he said, you know, we were talking about some challenges I had, and he says, don't put a time frame on it. It can happen a day, a week, a month. Don't, don't, don't limit it. Just let that, God bring it when he wants to bring it. Because we can block that. Yes? Acceptance is the key. Accepting our condition the way it is with Christ. Um, as we can resist, like you said, we can block it through resistance, through strongholds, whatever. But when we can accept our weakness, that's right. Before God, with in Christ, and you know, just accept it and allow Him to work, allow Him to do the work. He says His power is made perfect in weakness. So we, that's what I was saying last week. We've got to come to the point where we have to ask the grace. If we don't have the grace. Let me not be embarrassed or ashamed about my weaknesses and my failings. If I was going to do that, I'd spend the, every day from now until the day I died dealing with that stuff. So much of it. <laughs> uh, did I, tell you the I don't, did I tell you the story about Mother Nadine when she was in the amphitheater? She, Mother Nadine was in prayer one day and, and, and she found herself in this amphitheater and all she heard was all of her sins being declared and she knew it was Satan that was doing it. He said it took a really long time because she had so many sins. And when, when he got through, she heard another voice and she, she knew it was the Father and the Father said, what do you have to say? She says, what are you going to say in the, in, the, in the face of pure truth? She said, guilty. She says, but that's when I noticed Jesus standing beside me. And he put his arm around me with a blood red cloak and he said, not guilty. Mm. Mm. The fear of punishment 
the fear has got to do with punishment, and we will continue to fear if we're still afraid of judgment. When we understand God has taken that judgment away and nailed it to the cross. Now that doesn't mean we don't have to change our ways and we don't have to have a change of heart and we don't have to, to think again. Repentare means, in Latin means to think again. You know, I had to think again today when I said, oh, I'm just going to interrupt my tongue prayer time. I said, no, you're not. It's not. Just think about this. You can, nothing's going to interrupt that. What are you talking about? You're thinking like, you're thinking like a human being. You're not thinking like God. Didn't, didn't Jesus ream out Peter for that? And uh, Mother Teresa said, you give it away and let God fill it back up again. Give it away and let God fill and it back up again. And the more you give it away, the more the river within us widens. Because rivers of living water are going to issue forth from our bellies. And we're speaking of the Spirit who had not yet been given because he hadn't been, yet been glorified. You see, we've got the Spirit through baptism. And this is and here's, here's the crux of, t of tonight. Um, as I said last week, Jesus ministered in the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was always true God, and he was true man. But he didn't deem equality with God something to be grasped at. He emptied himself. So when he, he could have called down ten legions of angels, but he didn't do it. Because he was following the dictates of the Father that he knew he had to go, and he set his face like flint toward Jerusalem to go to the cross. Okay? We... Well, and, 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 that, and you're, you're hitting right on some points. Like the, one of the points before I go into this thing, thing about the dual purpose of the Holy Spirit, Ruth Ward Heflin, who was a, she died a few, several years ago. She was a third generation Pentecostal minister. I, saw, I, I sat under her ministry with Monsignor Walsh down in, in Philadelphia at a, at a, at a conference. And, and she was just, she knew about the Holy Spirit extremely well. And, and they, they ministered together so beautifully. But she wrote three books on glory. And they're well worth reading. Heflin is her name, H-E-F-L-I-N. And she said the, the, the motion of prayer is um, we thank and praise God. We start out by praising God. A lot of people don't do that. And Mary was talking to me on the phone about that. You know, people learning to pray vocally over people. That also is praying, not praying over people only, but praying vocally, praying thanksgiving, praise you, Jesus, hallelujah. Let that be in, in, uh, invigorated by the Holy Spirit. But praise will enter us into worship, which is a different level of prayer. And we're sort of worshiping at that point just the, 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 who he is. But there's a different level besides that, and it's entering into his glory. In Hebrew, they call it Shekinah glory. It's the manifest presence of God. In the glory is all the provision, all the healing, all the understanding, all the finances, everything we need. He will fully supply all your need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. That's where everything comes from. I mean, we might. I worked for people through my career, and I got my paycheck from them, but they weren't the source of it. The source of it was God's glory, okay? The source of the healing is God's glory. He may want to work for, through a nutritionist, a psychiatrist, a doctor, a cardiologist. That's fine. He's created those things. They're wonderful gifts. It's the source of it is still God's glory. But when I pray for people, I say, you know, do whatever your faith dictates about what kind of treatment you need. If you, if you, you can't get it done, you go see a doctor. Makes sense. I said, but what I'd like to ask you to consider, and this is the way I pray, Something's going on with me. I said, Lord, I, I need some help over here. If you want to lead me to do it some way, I sure wouldn't mind if you just didn't do it yourself. <laughs> I'll give you a first shot at it. How many people give them first shot at it? Give them first shot at these things. You know? It's like Mother Nadine about, you know, casting out spirits. They, they, spirits will also interfere with, like, cars and computers and other type of things. And uh, she said... The first thing they do if their computer system goes haywire, they bind and they cast out any spirits from it. This is, if there's not there and they don't go, it doesn't make any difference. They call the computer tech. If it goes, they save themselves a bill. My daughter Gabrielle was going to Steubenville. She was going to do, she went to Steubenville. She was going to do a master's in theology there. And um, she told me she needed, a, I don't think I told you this, a laptop. And 
I said, we'll look and we'll see, you know, we'll get what the price of new ones are, refurbished ones and stuff like that. And she had gone to this conference with Mother Nadine and she prayed about it and she came back to me and said, Dad, you know, the Lord told me to stop looking for the laptop. Not to look for a laptop. I said, don't you need it? She said, I do. And I, and I said, um, okay, it's, you're close to it. It's your deal. If we're not going to, you don't need it. If he, he told you not to do it, we won't do it. Two months later, it was the end of my career at EJ because they closed down the thing and moved it away. And they gave me a laptop. I gave it to her. Now, we could have spent the money on the laptop. God saved me a few bucks. <laughs> He's good. God is good. Right. Yes, Charlie. I got another example. Uh, this guy was fixing, he was putting up a uh, uh, stand, stand up, standard uh, uh, sink in the bathroom. And he didn't do too many of them. And he was having a heck of a time with it. He'd get it, he'd get it all done, and then he'd turn it on, and it wouldn't work. So I, 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 you know, I knew he was frustrated. I walked up there and I said, you know, and this guy is, a, is an excellent person, and do not do this to him. Do not frustrate this poor guy. He's a good person, he would never complain. And the next time he did it, the thing worked. You know, Three years ago, before I did a, a retreat up in Syracuse, we had an air conditioner that, um, we had a grandchild over, I think he was yeah, two years old, well, maybe he was one year old. It was hot and the, and the air conditioner wasn't working. We only, we had a new furnace and air conditioner we put in like five years earlier, and I said, this, this is not right. And I can see the fan going in there, but there's no coolant, you know, so I called the people and they sent somebody down, and they said, uh, yeah, <clears throat> you're right, the compressor's gone. It's under warranty, but you got to pay for the labor. Now, the labor is still, you know, hundreds of dollars. And uh, the guys that come in and put the Freon in it, and they got a special license, you got to pay a little extra for that, you know. So we get this thing done, it was like uh, 700 bucks. We got air conditioning. I said, fine, it's good. I, got, gave, I had the money, it was okay. And then, like, a week later, it stops again, and even, even the fan isn't going on it. I call the people, I said, look, it, it's hot, I got a grandson here. I just spent seven hundred dollars to a new compressor, um, and it's not working. What, what can you do? And they said, "Well, we're going to send a really seasoned guy down, but he can't come till tomorrow." I said, "Fine." So the guy comes down, and uh, I said, "I th I think that the breaker hasn't kicked. I know there's two twenty coming to here. I'm pretty sure there is." Now let me go and see. And he takes the thing off and he checks. He says, "Yeah, two twenty's coming to here, but it's not getting over to the compressor or to the fan." He says, "Let me take the panel off of here." He goes, oh, "I see what it is." And I said, well, what is it? He says, it's a bug. I said, what? He said, yeah, a little bug got lodged between this contact point, and it was keeping 220 from going through. Oh. He turned, you know, he unplugged it so he didn't kill himself, yeah. pulled the bug out, brushed it off, put it back together, whoosh, <laughs> another 50 bucks. So I told the people to retreat, best 750 bucks I ever got, because now I can teach on it. What's the little bug in your life that's keeping the power of the Holy Spirit from flowing through you? It may not be, it may not be a big thing. It wasn't a big thing. It was a little bug. You can hardly even see it. Okay? What's keeping you from the freedom? What's keeping you from the healing? What's keeping you from, the, for, from loving like Jesus loves? But the Holy Spirit is the one that reveals that. I did a, 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 a ministry training in, in Toronto in the mid-90s, prophetic Christian prayer counseling, and it was a formulaic prayer, and it was very solid and it was scripturally based, but when you got to actual praying, yes, the Holy Spirit revealed to you what needed to be healed. And we did the same thing with our thoughts. They call them, you know, we have thoughts that we think that are not godly thoughts, they're ungodly thoughts. And so you pray to the Holy Spirit, show me some ungodly thoughts that I'm harboring. The son of a gun, he did. <laughs> See, he's waiting for us to just ask him to shine the light on it. You know, his word is a lamp unto my feet, right? It doesn't show you a whole lot, but it'll show me what that thought is. It'll show me what that bug is. It'll show me what that brick in the wall is. He may not show me more than that, but that's all I need today. If today I hear his voice, please don't let me harden my heart, as they did in Meribah in the <coughs> desert. They tested me, even though they'd seen my works. How many of us have seen his works? We've seen his works, and yet we don't trust him. That's why I love... Jesus, I trust in you. I mean, it, it's all wrapped up in that. 
you know, or Mary's spirituality. It's all wrapped up in that. Let it be done unto me according to your word, and do whatever he tells you. You don't need anything more than that in aspects of it. I know you have to work it out and live it out and stuff like that. But if we could, live, if we could understand that spirituality, we wouldn't have so many problems. We wouldn't be stuck so much. We wouldn't be... Um, and it, it takes a long time when you, especially if you've been graced with some kind of an intellect and, and that's been praised, but the obedience to God's word hasn't been praised and you didn't understand it. And I've been dealing with this for my whole lifetime. Um, when I was uh, in grade school, I was on a, a, a student council. I don't even know how I... I was in fifth grade, and, and, and Patty Newman was in sixth grade. She was the president of the student council. I think I was in the student council because Patty Newman was in the student council. But anyway, they had, a, they had a thing where we had a contest in our school. Who do the best poster for don't being a litter bug? And everybody made don't be a litter bug posters. And we had, we had local grocery stores, not corner stores. So Patty and I and the teacher went over to Mr. Criswell's store. The press came, got a pictures in the paper. He put the thing on his basket out there, oh, don't be a litter bug. Mr. Criswell says, you guys are really, this is doing a great thing. He says, can I give you something, a popsicle or a fudgicle? And I said, yeah, I love fudgicles. Gave me a fudgicle. I took the wrapper off and threw it on the ground. Uh, <laughs> Listen, guys, if I can make a breakthrough in the freedom, anybody can. You understand? I knew what Jesus said since 1973. He opened up the scriptures to me. And I'm not saying I didn't do it some, but I didn't do enough to bear the kind of fruit that he needed. And through a lot of struggles, and I think we've all gone through them, we're, gonna, we're getting to the point right now. And the other thing is, is when, the, when, we, when we go into this praise and worship and enter into his glory, remember last week I told you that I had this image in, in New Orleans of this, this steel plate that was keeping the God was lamenting because his graces, which he poured out, didn't penetrate through, and people were, were, were so in need of them they weren't getting them. Um, I just heard this testimony the other day, this guy sent it to me, about what's happening now on the face of the earth. God is moving. We think God is moving. We know he's, he's always been moving, but we think that something is imminent right now. There's, I found out some stuff that's going in this area that's really encouraging. And what happens is when we praise and worship and we enter into the glory, it's almost like we create another hole in that dense plate that's keeping the graces from flowing to us and also from blocking our prayers, prayers from growing up. And going up. And what the lady was saying was, and I loved it because I related to it, she says, it took me, you know, just because it took me 30 or 40 years to get here, it doesn't mean people today are going to have to take 30 or 40 years because all openings of grace are starting to appear. And grace is going to be poured out, you know. Um, the guys that did it from the beginning, it worked all the day, didn't like it. They, he gave the, the same pain to the guys that got it at the end. Same thing been battling about this for 40, 40 something years, 45 years, okay? If you got the exact same grace and anointing, I'd be, I'd be tickled pink and I'd dance with you. Because we need people whose hearts are set on God and they're inflamed. You know, in the Desert Fathers, is tremendous wisdom, third century Egyptian desert. This one uh, father went to this abbot and he said, you know, I, I, I do my fast, I do my prayers, I do my alms, I do all these things, you know. And, and he said, you know, and, and the other guy that he went to counsel from, he says, good. He says, which his hands out and, and fire shot out of his fingers. He says, why don't you become fire? That's the call right now. Heck, hang to cast a fire on the earth. He wants us to burn with the power and the fire of the Holy Spirit. And just like the burning bush, you won't, the bush didn't lose its, its identity as bush. Maria won't lose her identity as Maria, but she'll be Maria on fire. Okay? That's the level of commitment and grace we need to receive. It's not something we can figure out. It's gift, it's grace, it's gift, it's gift. Scripture says it's all grace. It's all grace. It's not something that we're, we have some kind of natural abilities to get. It's just grace. Anybody can receive it. The guy on the cross, uh, Lord, I could be with you today in paradise. And he went up with him right at the last moment. Lived a bad life. He was crucified justly. I, you know, I mean, nobody can be crucified justly, but he was, put, yeah. he, was, he was suffering something because he did something wrong. Not a problem. Yeah, Not a problem. 
You don't have to go out and you got to do 17 novenas and you don't have to do this and do that. And there's nothing wrong with doing all that stuff. And all I'm saying is that's not the stuff that touches God's heart. It's a contrite and humble spirit you will not spurn. Just a compunction of the heart. Let the Holy Spirit come in and just... Sometimes, you know, just during the day, I just, you know, I, I'm feeling his presence so strong right now. It's starting to, it's starting to come. So when two rabbis, I got this from the, my, my Hasidic Jewish mentor early on, two rabbis were arguing over some point, and they, they couldn't agree. And one of them said, well, let's call God down to answer. And God started to enter the room, and the other rabbi said no, and God left. That's what we're doing. We don't know it, but that's what we're doing. I, I, I got to finish. That's what, that's what we're doing. Somehow, our hearts are still hard. Our hearts are still stony. And that's not a condemnation. That's just a, re, a factual reality. But he said he'd take out the heart of stone and he'd give us a heart of flesh. How does he do that? How can we hope for that? And our hope is not disappointed because the love of God has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. So here's the deal about the Holy Spirit. In baptism, we have the Holy Spirit. You cannot, you baptize, the Holy Spirit comes into our lives. No question about it. You say Jesus is Lord, you have the Holy Spirit. You can't say Jesus is Lord without the Holy Spirit. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a different function of the Holy Spirit because the first function of the Holy Spirit builds character which is really important. The second function of the Holy Spirit equips us for ministry, which is really important. Now, would you have, rather have somebody who just had character or would you rather have just somebody that had power? The people that just had character, they may not be able to do that much. The people who just had power, if they don't have character, watch out. <laughs> You're in for a tumble. But if you can have the gifts of the Holy Spirit built on top of character, set your hearts on love and eagerly seek after the spiritual gifts, especially that you might prophesy. And he who prophesies encourages, upbuilds, and consoles. That's what we should be doing more than anything else in the church. Building one another up, consoling people. Building them up. And we have to build up ourselves. We have to build up ourselves. So, we need to get to know Jesus personally, but we also need to get to know the Holy Spirit personally. In Acts 19, and from what I gather, it's a goodly number of years past the day of Pentecost. This isn't like a, day, a year or two, it's many years past. Apollos was in Corinth. Paul traveled through the interior of the country and came down to Ephesus where he found some disciples. He said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you came believers? They answered him, we never even heard there was a Holy Spirit. How were you baptized? We were baptized in the baptism of John. Paul said that John baptized the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, and Paul laid his hands on them, and the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongues, and they prophesied. So it was happening all through the New Testament. It's been happening all through history. It happened on the day of Pentecost. All gathered in the upper room, when Pentecost had fully come, or the day had fully come, one translation says, tongues of the fire came, settled on all of them, and they all spoke in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. There's a message in there. In anything that's going on, the Trinity does something and we got a part. The Father sent the Son, right? The Son laid down his life, sent the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit's job is to enable us or to help us. Okay? They began to speak in tongues as, as the Spirit gave them utterance or enabled them. Okay? Our job is to begin. Our job is to hear the word of God, to go into prayer, asking him what the prayer is, act on it. When he says something to me, you get that little nudge on the inside. Maybe it's not the time, maybe it's not convenient, but you start to know his voice. You simply do that. You begin to act on that. Like I began to act on, you know, I want to go to New Orleans. How do I do that? And it all fell into place. You know, there's many, there's many, there's many, many, many examples of it. Um, Pope Francis says the charismatic renewal is the stream of grace. He's not talking about like a movement. The movement aspect of it got all discombobulated. A tsunami of grace flooding the earth. Pope Francis says there's a tsunami of grace that's flooding the earth right now. 
So when I heard Ralph Martin address this in, I think, 2017 down in Baltimore at a Christ Life conference, he said um, he and the people that he thought that he had, he has a small group that he's prayed with for decades. And when they heard this message, they said, you know, in order to hear and respond to this tsunami of grace, we're going to increase our prayer lives. And they had good, hefty prayer lives at that point. They said, we're going to take whatever our prayer life it is, and we're going to add 50% more onto it. And they did. When I heard that, I said, well, you know, God's sort of been nudging me in that direction. It makes sense, so I'm going to do that. And I found out, you know, there was time. We got time. Just look at, you look at your calendar, see what you do with your time. I'm not saying we're doing bad things, but <laughs> there's time for prayer. And so what I want to encourage you today is, if you haven't got a set prayer time, do a set prayer time. And I'm talking about going to the Eucharist is wonderful. I go to the Eucharist as often as I can. I pray the rosary every day. But we need time when we're quiet and we're listening to God. And we've got time when we, we write down what he says. And I've been going back since a couple weeks ago, and I went back into my journal since 1993, and I started looking at all these prophetic words God gave me along the way. And I... I'm convinced he's been pointing at this in the direction and I just wasn't getting it. I took that fudgeable wrapper and I threw it yeah. on the ground. <laughs> oh, you want me to be involved in the renewal of upstate New York? That's fine. Throw the wrapper on the ground. Mm -hmm. You want me to pray for St. Anthony to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Just threw that wrapper on the ground. Mm -hmm. I, I, I got to think again about that. I got to repent about that. Mm -hmm. Okay, you've brought me out. He's translated me from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. Isn't that great? He's translated us. It's like Star Trek. We get beamed to another, into another place. 400 to 500 billion galaxies. We're one galaxy in this one little planet. And he's taken us to specks of dirt. Covered us with the blood of the Lamb and filled us with the Holy Ghost. When we get to heaven, we're going to do lots of things. We, don't even, we can't even ask or imagine. Scripture says a couple things. It indicates it. Don't you know you're going to judge the world? And don't you know you're going to judge the angels? What does that mean? It's in there. It's in Peter. So I, he says, if it's more than you can ask or imagine, I start saying, well, if there's four or 500 billion galaxies, maybe there's life someplace else, and maybe he's going to train us up and send us off on a loving mission to some other galaxy far, far away. If I can imagine it, it's got to be at least as good as that, if not more. He's more creative than I am. How creative is he? Just go out and look in your yard. Look at all the... My wife's a great gardener, and I time that something changes. There's new colors coming up all over the place. I mean, she learned how to cooperate with that, but she can't make them grow. She knows how to plant the seeds, and she knows how to fertilize them. Can't make them grow. She can help them grow. We can help each other grow. Okay? And God told me, when I teach on the Holy Spirit from the Scriptures, He will fill people with the Holy Spirit. So, just before we leave, in a few minutes, we're going to um, just going to pray. And and I, I've got um, all these Scripture references. When I teach, the way I teach is God gives me a topic, or some, if I'm teaching someplace, they give me a topic they want to speak on. I go and I search the scriptures, and I, I sort of get them into a, a some kind of coherent message. I hope, um, and then I meditate on them, and I've got them if I need them, if, or else I just go where he wants me to go. But the scriptural study is good. So those that I have um, uh, emails for, if, if you want the scriptural study background on these things, I'm happy to give them to them. It's a good meditation. Um, you know, next week we're going we're gonna to talk about uh, how we actually cooperate with this and how we live it out. And at the end of next week, we're going to be in the church next week because they have a Bible study down here. Mm -hmm. It's the Bible studies that say 6 to 7 or a little bit over. So even if you go to that Bible study, which some of you do, just come on upstairs afterwards. We're going to do that. And then at 8 o'clock, um, Mary has arranged for, uh, the gentleman's name is Bob? Jeremy. Jeremy Bobeck. He's a really good ministry in music. He's going to come down and he's going to do some music while we sit before the Blessed Sacrament and just listen to the Lord. And what I'd like you to do, if you, if you don't already do it, if you do, bring your journal or bring a notebook. And while you're um, just before the Lord and listening to him, just start writing things down that you feel he's saying to you. And sometimes it's going to be you. Sometimes it's going to be him. After a while, you'll start to discern what the, the differences are in, in asking him, you know, what he wants. Like two Sundays ago, I, I really had this on my heart to go and visit this fellowship. I go every couple of years to Oligo and everything was lining up pretty good, you know, at the Mass on 
Saturday night, and then you know there's nothing we had to do Sunday morning, so I think I can go there. And I remember I didn't ask the Lord about it. I said, Lord, do you want me to go there? And he says, no, I don't. <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> but he told me yesterday he wants me to go tomorrow, or whatever that is, Sunday. I don't even know what day it is. It's Wednesday. So we can ask him those things, and he will tell us. He'll give us that little nudge. You know, it will put us in a place that's safe. Frank, I want you to stop the side business. I just want you to spend more time in prayer and study. So you can be free on September 8, 2001 to go pick up your son John so he doesn't have to take the train to the World Trade Center at 9 o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. on September 11th. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. No idea! But that's okay. He's not giving us a long picture. I told you last week, you know, I asked him if he'd give me a longer view of things, and he said, absolutely not, you screw it up. <laughs> I said, okay. So I stopped pressing him on that. You know, once I really hear, you know, it takes me a while to, to get things. So you keep on asking questions, right? You keep on asking questions. I was like that, and I was in a very, a class in high school with some very, very smart kids. Uh, we had done, they had us do special projects one afternoon when we were in, in, in junior high school. We went off to this, and the, one of the guys I was in the class, just to tell you what I was up against, I think in, in eighth grade, he did a two and a half hour lecture on subatomic, subatomic particles with no notes. And that's what I was trying to keep up with. So we were in a math class, and these guys were, you know, and, I, and I, as I said, you know, they never say this. They used to call us the superior class. <laughs> math 12 superior. But when they were doing geometry, I wasn't getting some of it, and I kept on asking the question. He's a good teacher, but I asked him 100 questions until I finally got it. And I saw, I saw the light, and I said, oh, I see. And so when you do a triangle, next time you did a triangle, instead of labeling it A, B, and C, you label it OIC. <laughs> I'm glad I asked the questions because I would be so left so far behind. Okay? We don't want to be left behind in the spiritual life and in what God's going on in this revival that's coming onto the face of the earth. So ask him questions. If you've got questions, ask him. He's not afraid of that. He loves intellectual honesty. When I had the belly of the whale as my restaurant, and I had my conversion, and there was two gals that were working with us. One was cooking, one was serving tables. After I had the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and I had met the Lord, I accepted him, we started meeting at 7 o'clock in the morning at the restaurant, praying for our relatives, interceding for about an hour. And I saw, you know, my sister got converted, my other sister got converted, my mother, my father, you know, all, all sorts of different people. My wife, my, uh, uh, her sister, all, and, and the guy who was my partner, who eventually became my brother-in-law, um, he, he was really getting irritated with me because I was quite zealous about Jesus and people would come in and I'd tell them about Jesus and he says, God damn it, Frank, can't you just sell them brown rice and seaweed? Yeah. <laughs> Why do you have to tell them about Jesus all the time? Yeah. I said, I don't know, Larry, man, it's important to me. So we were at Larry's house this one night and I was talking about Jesus and the girls talk about Jesus too, these girls. Yeah. And he said, okay, you guys got to go, you know, you got to go. Yeah. So the next morning, I'm opening up the restaurant at 7 o'clock in the morning and down... Floral Avenue in Johnson City comes walking Larry. I said, Larry didn't get up at 7 o'clock in the morning. I said, Larry, what are you doing here? He says, last night, you know, we were driving you crazy. You told us to leave. He says, yeah, I did. He says, when you left, I told God, if these people are true, you've got to change my mind. And I said, I said, what happened? He said, he did. All God wants is honest, intellectual honesty. We can't be healed if we're not ourselves. If we're hiding it, if we're hiding it, just like Adam and Eve, we hit it, we, we cover our shame, we cover our guilt, we cover all the stuff. And I think it's worth reading this one other thing that I read last week. If I can find it quickly. This is a, from my journal, February 15th, 2003. My son, strongholds begin to form, not when you sin, but when you hide your sin, when shame and guilt lead not to repentance, but to denial. And most, most of us are, are in denial. I can't be as bad as they tell me. I am. Other people are worse, aren't they? <laughs> They're not. They're not. They're not worse than you either. You're as bad as it gets. And as bad as it can get is as good as it can get. Because as our sister said, where grace abounds, sin abounds, grace abounds more fully. So don't worry about it. If you think you're in a big hole, big hole right now, just think about the big mountain Jesus is going to put you on. He's just waiting for you to, to, to let him lead you by the Holy Ghost. So, when, when we pray, 
And Christ Life sort of did this. And Mother Nadine, she, she brought it home in, in a different way. Um, every time she prayed with people, she always prayed them for them to ask to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We're too far down the road not to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We need Pentecost every day. Every day, I, I, in part of my morning offering, I pray the Cardinal Mercier's prayer to the Holy Spirit. Oh, Holy Spirit, soul of my soul, I adore thee. Enlighten, guide, strengthen, and console me. Tell me what to do and command me to do it. I promise to be submissive in everything you ask of me and accept all you permit to happen to me. Just show me what your will is. Okay? Now, those are wonderful words. I wish I could say I was living them 100%. But I'm, I'm, I'm living them 1% more than I have been living them. Okay? And I'm going to keep on praying it until I get it. And if I don't get it before I, I, I leave the face of the earth, God will put me in a little time out and clean me up so that I can get into his presence. Grace, grace, he's so merciful. There's a great book by uh, uh, Lay Apostle Land called The Mist of Mercy. It's a revelation she had about purgatory and how God covers people and doesn't bring shame to them, but helps them to clear out the stuff that hadn't been surrounded, that hadn't been surrendered to him yet. I got enough problems. He's given me, he's allowed enough problems in my life that I really don't have to go anyplace besides directly to him. I'm not saying I'm, that's going to happen, but we all have plenty of stuff on our plates to deal with in, in compassion and love and like, you know, Sister uh, or uh, St. Teresa of Lisieux said, there was this one sister in her order, and she just couldn't stand it. Her sister drove her nuts. But she always went out of her way to be very kind to her and pray for her. And one day, the sister said, I just can't believe how nice you are to me and how much you love me. She wasn't doing it because she felt like doing it. She knew it because it was the will of God to love as he loved. That wasn't being phony. That was being the truest true. She wasn't looking for something in return. What good is it to love you to love, to love those that love you? Even the Gentiles do that. Even the sinners do that. But can we love the, the people that are our enemies? And Jesus said your enemies will be those in your own household. So sometimes you just don't have to look for them. Okay? Doesn't mean they're bad people. The Lynn brothers said they defined enemy. They're two Jesuit priests that had wonderful, wonderful ministry and teaching about healing. They said an enemy is anything or any person you want to change. Think about it. Anybody in your life you'd like to change? They're your enemy. Okay. Well, I was yet a sinner. Jesus didn't reject me. He loved me just like I was. In fact, it says he was the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. I know he cru was crucified in, in, in 33 3 AD in time and space, but he was the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. To me, in my pea brain, that says he saw Frank and he saw every stupid, unloving, selfish, blah, blah, blah thing that I would do he said, I'm just going to stay with the boy until I wake him up. And I'll let him hit his head a few times and skin his knees. You know, I won't kill him, but I'm going to come close <laughs> until he wakes up. And if he really, really, really can't get you done, then he probably let you die. I don't know. I'm just figuring out how this works a little bit. <laughs> so we've got, we've got it. So Christ's life says this, and this is how I'd like to close tonight. This is a prayer of commitment. And if you want to, I'm going to say this and you can say it after me. Lord God, please forgive me for all the things I have done wrong. I turn to you and turn away from sin. Okay, now just in your own heart, the stuff that's coming up, you just ask God to forgive you, just yourself, between you and God. Things that you know that you know that might be weighing you down. Jesus, please be the center of my life. I welcome you personally as Lord and Savior of my life. I ask you, Holy Spirit, to fill me and empower me to live as a child of God. I want to have your grace to truly live a new life. Thank you for hearing my prayer through Christ our Lord. Lord, I ask you to send a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit upon my brothers and sisters tonight, that you'd, you'd confirm your word with signs and wonders, whatever that means to them in their lives. 
Lately for me, it was just stepping into a place away from the struggle that I didn't think I'd ever, ever get past. For Jean, the same thing, experiencing that kind of freedom. For Louise, praying for her son to pray in a more hopeful way. Not in fear and anxiety, but in trusting in the Lord. We've all got situations we need to have a little deeper prayer in. And it's not like I can figure out how to do that, but we can be led by the Holy Spirit. So lead us, Holy Spirit. I bless every person here in your name, Lord. I bless their families, their husbands, their wives, their children, their comings, their goings, their goods, their possessions, their businesses, their ministries, their travels, their pets. Let it all come under the power of your most precious blood. Help us together as a community, Lord, to be a, a sign of your love to people, especially those people that would look at us and say, I can't, something's different about this guy now. He's a little kinder than he was. He's, he's a little more a little less quick-tempered than he used to be. They can see the change in our hearts, the change in our hearts. And Lord, you've got angels and saints that are interceding for us now. We know we've got guardian angels, but there's other angels that he assigns to bring that message to us. As I lead you, says the Lord, remember the battle is mine. You have nothing to fear. Just keep your eyes fixed on my son Jesus. Pray in the Holy Spirit. In all things, give thanks. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, I don't know. Is it just me, or is are we feeling the presence of the Holy Ghost there? Huh? Sorry. I have a question and accessory for her. You said that you prayed for the conversion of a few of your relatives, and they converted. Yep. Now, did the prayer influence God, or was it the other way around? Because that part I don't get with the accessory prayer. Are we praying to change God's mind? And if there's enough people that intercede for us in heaven, like St. Anthony or the Blessed Mother, right, right. will they change Jesus or God's mind? Or, or is it all set? Or, you know, that part, I don't get that. Well, for, ex for example, in the, for regarding conversion, yeah. God says, I'm saved and none should perish. I already know what his will is about that. Mm -hmm. I can pray that a conversion, fully understanding that's the will of God. Okay? But there are other things when we go in that we don't know exactly, it's not like doctrinally true, or it's, it's not like, I know, for example, in all things I should give thanks, because it says, in all things give thanks for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. That's pretty clear. In other place, this is the will of God, your holiness. I know my holiness, my being set apart for him. Not that I become holy, but Jesus who knew no sin for my sake became sin that in him I've become the very holiness or righteousness of God. It's all got to do with union with him. So those things that he's declared about our status in, in, in relationship to him, we can pray for those things to be manifested. So I believe in intercession, what happens is it goes out and I think graces are dispersed to, to clear the air, so to speak, for people that they can hear it and make their own. Everybody's got to make their own decision. They got to make a decision. Okay, I believe that people, God heals. Peter says, it's by his wounds you are healed. Now, I understand there's the mystery of suffering, and I know th great things can come out of people that have been sick and stuff like that, but that doesn't negate the fact that God heals. So I, I can pray for anybody to be healed because I believe that God, that God wants people to be healed. Okay? I don't know exactly how he wants them to be healed, but that's why I can ask for the... And I know I didn't do it until he asked me last week. He said, I go too long, and he had to go to the bathroom. <laughs> Now, we're, next week we're going to be upstairs, same time, and we're going to have some time before the Lord for a while, maybe a half hour, 45 minutes or something like that, if you can make it. People will go to the, the Bible study, if you want to just finish that out, you want to come up and catch the rest of it and spend some time before the Blessed Sacrament, we can do that. I thank you all for coming. Yes, Joe? Yeah, just a quick question, going back to the prayer. If it was God's will for them to be converted, then... If you said the prayer or not, would that have been a mute point? Or why was that prayer important for the conversion if it was already God's will to convert them? 
because there, there are principalities and powers that try and keep us in darkness and try and keep us blinded. And sometimes we have to do the spiritual warfare battle in intercession to clear the air, like Paul Yonggi Cho's church did in Seoul, Korea, where they cleared the air, and those army soldiers all of a sudden were having conversions with the same sermons, the same chaplain. Okay, why didn't they get it in Germany? Same sermon, same chaplain, same truth. Okay, so we need, that's why we've got to create an environment in the church where we believe that God, what God is saying. It, it, it's not complicated. It really isn't. He says what's true, okay? But he says certain things are of a priority. And the greatest priority is to love one another as he's loved us. Everything is based on top of that. We can have all the gifts we want and we can have all this other stuff. If we're, if we're not being transformed into a loving people, then you can become like the, some of the televangelists. They're not all bad, but some of them just like are really off in, into outer space with some stuff right now. We've been, uh... I've been trying to share.